I will just, I would like to welcome everybody for this second webinar, uh, Knowledge Exchange between India and Rwanda. It's very exciting. Monday, we, we had a really exciting group. We had 116 people from 23 countries. And so today we're going to get the opportunity to hear from Rwandan experts. And then we'll also, uh, we also have the luck to have uh, Rabi Prabhu and uh, Walter Jene from Australia to uh, support Vijay today during the uh, uh, Q&A and discussing period. So just to give a brief overview, uh, on Monday we really had the, the great opportunity to hear from Vijay on um, natural farming in India and, and the amazing strides that have been happening there, supported by women's self-help group. And it was very exciting to learn how um, regenerative agriculture is being practiced in India, in Andhra Pradesh, as particularly using natural farming, and how it's having impact not only on increased farmer income, but also on um, nutritional status of populations. And also, one of the things that uh, we didn't have enough time to tell us is also, this is also having impacts on health. They are seeing anecdotal for now, but um, decreased rates of malaria infection. And so it's very exciting to think that farmers are gaining more income, that the productivity of the land is increasing, that biodiversity is returning to levels that were previously um, unheard of with uh, chemical uh, focused farming. And so it's very exciting for me today to be able to have uh, our Rwandan counterparts um, present and um, allow us to hear from Rwandan perspectives so that we can have a reflection in terms of where is Rwanda right now in terms of um, the challenges and opportunities to scale regenerative farming and to learn and practice and, and uh, be able to apply natural farming uh, technologies, ways of doing in Rwanda in ways that can really accelerate uh, productivity. For now, right now, 70% of Rwanda's population are involved in farming and they contribute 30% of GDP. As uh, Vijay and I were talking a little bit earlier this morning here, was this idea that in some cases, when we're able to increase solar organic carbon, and are able to really have a, a, a living biological agricultural system, productivity can sometimes go up to two, three times. So imagine that if we were able to increase the agricultural uh, contributions to, to GDP in Rwanda from 30% to much higher. And so this could make a significant change. And what is great is as we navigate COVID, it's very important for farmers to be able to have all their inputs available locally. And so this is really a very important way to navigate COVID, increase local, local food security, increase the use of um, biological methods to accelerate agricultural productivity in ways that align with the current constraints COVID is putting out in the world. And one of the things we've also been talking about is the importance of metrics. How do we measure well, how all of this is happening. So I really think the combination of natural farming and digitalization of agriculture working together can be transformational and can help us achieve zero hunger and zero poverty in the world. And uh, Rwanda, the Rwanda Agriculture Board has a very strong presence here today. And, and, and I know we have had discussions since COVID started on the importance of agricultural digitalization in Rwanda. And so I'm very excited to have all of you here today and I see we've, uh, we're going up by the minute. Now we're up to 65 participants. So it's very exciting for me. Um, just want to check if uh, Juliet is here yet. Yes, she is joining. Okay, yes. excellent, excellent. So what we'll do, uh, because we have eight speakers from Rwanda, I really want to start uh, our discussion um, as, as, as quick as possibly. And so uh, Juliet, if you can, um, join us and and uh and uh, open your your microphone so we can hear you and uh let us know if you'll be sharing your screen or if uh, swati needs to pull up your slides so uh juliet i would like to hand it over to you i'm not able to see her now but she had definitely joined the call and she dropped out okay if yes. she's dropped 
Yes, I had the promoted her, but uh, to the panelist. But okay. Yeah, she's okay. yeah, she's here. She's here, just a second. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So just as we wait for uh, uh, Julia to join us, I see our second speaker, Pascal, is here and ready. I'm very excited to hear from Pascal as soon as Juliet is done. Uh, Pascal and I have had very exciting discussions. Pascal is a soil scientist from Rwanda, so it'll be very exciting to, to initiate discussions with Walter uh, in, the, in the discussion period. Uh, Pascal is passionate about soil organic carbon increase, and uh, that will be very exciting to, uh, to get us there. So um, let's see if we can get Juliet. If we can't get Juliet, maybe we can have Pascal start if that's an issue because I really want us to. Uh... Yeah, she's dropping out of the call because. Uh, yeah. Okay. Can okay. We... So so maybe what we'll do, Pascal, are you okay uh, starting? I'm okay. Okay, okay, great, great. So, so, so we'll start with you and we'll hopefully Juliet will be able to join as soon as possible. So, uh, so um, we all have the biographies. I'm going to be very brief in my introductions to make sure we have a lot of time for discussion. So as I said, uh, Pascal is a senior soil scientist at the Rwanda Agricultural Board. And um, I'm very excited to have Pascal with us today. One of the issues we know is that in order to uh, mitigate climate change, uh, soil organic carbon sequestration is going to be more and more urgently a viable solution to um, mitigation of climate change and decreasing temperatures that uh, we know in Rwanda, temperatures I've seen in my life have, have, have increased. And so this is one of the critical elements that is uh, going to be uh, part of the solutions that I see that uh, natural farming can be bringing. And so uh, Pascal, out to you. Yeah. I know, yeah, I was just helping my colleague to attend Jabu uh, Chabu has not yet the link and the liberal. I'm just helping a little bit outside. Okay, 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 okay. I, I, I will, okay, I will make sure. Go ahead. So, go ahead, Pascal. Uh, sorry, come in. I need, I have to present. Yes. Okay. I can uh, share my, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll just make you the co-host, sir. Unless you, you allow me to share the, the screen. You'll be able yes. to do so, please try. Yeah, you can, you can share the screen. Okay, just next to chat. We already chat. Okay, good, good. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Elian, how, how much time I have? So if you could do this in 10 minutes, that would be great. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Well, I thank you everybody and uh, I'm the outline of my presentation here. I, I to look a little bit on the concept and uh, I'll put the one in context and uh, I'll now share the experience of Rwanda in terms of regenerative agriculture and I'll end my uh, my presentation by concluding remarks. Without taking much of your time, yeah, regenerative agriculture is this kind of agriculture, uh, mainly uh, which aim at rebuilding soil organic matter and uh, restoring degraded soil. Uh, this means that um, Many practices that uh, we are using in agriculture are generally degrading. So it is almost the same uh, thing with sustainable intensification, which also aim at producing without degrading the production environment. Yeah, 
We have also the term natural farming, which is uh, a bit far and uh, insist on no use of fertilizer, no use of pesticide, no use of uh, herbicide. Is a, a kind of specific regenerative agriculture. We do also have ecological farming, which is near the natural farming. I think in the context of this presentation, it will be much about regenerative agriculture. So why regenerative agriculture? Because we need to conserve natural resource fertility and biodiversity along with indigenous seed and knowledge. We need to prevent issues such as decarbonization. We need to prevent erosion and desertification and chemical pollution. Much information can be done, uh, obtained under the link. How do we do that? We use technologies that generate and revitalize soil and the environment. Those technologies are conservation, are many, but I can say conservation agriculture, uh, cover crop, agroforestry, and many others. But in the context of Rwanda, I've chosen that. So regenerative agriculture in the context of Rwanda, current situation and perspectives. So here uh, I'm presenting Rwanda. This is elevation model. Rwanda is a very diversified country from uh, 900 meters above the sea to 400 into the volcano peak here. So the main objective of presenting this map here is to show the main agroecological zone, which is highland, midland, and lowland. And uh, they have their different characteristics here uh, in terms of elevation, uh, topography, temperature, and rainfall. So those differences have framed many agroecological zones in Rwanda. And uh, the many agroecological zones, we do have adapted crop. So we have 12 agroecological zones. Uh, and each agroecological zone in terms of one, two, three, has, which is also on this map, have specific crop. And uh, this was done by De Le Pierre in uh, 1976 and confirmed by Vedut 2003. So issue affecting regenerative agriculture in Rwanda. So this uh, slide, yeah, this slide, um, see the, uh, sorry. Uh, sorry, yes, this slide show the main constraint that agriculture uh, is facing. We do have inefficient so, uh, insufficient soil organic carbon. As you can see here, the soil do not have much organic matter. Uh, in addition to that, yeah, in addition to that, deep village. Uh, is also a factor of health site. Because of uh, insufficient organic matter, deep tillage, this result into uh, what you see here, uh, erosion. This result into uh, insufficient crop yield, unsustainable agriculture. And this end up by flooding uh, in the valley and siltation and water pollution in the valley. Those are the main issue. Uh, you see the image of this kind of degrading agriculture. So experience of Rwanda with regenerative agriculture, uh, it started with agroforestry. Agroforestry have started many years in Rwanda, I think before the creation of ICRAF uh, with the German, and it comes with uh, 
techniques and uh, results. So we do have three species adapted to each agroecological zone of Rwanda. We, I can say Alminus acuminata, which you can see on this photo, but we do have Caliandra, we do have Grevidea, and many others. Each agroecological zone have adapted uh, three species. Also, we do have many niches where we can put agroforestry, but the most recommended is the alley cropping and it's under its variant of hedgerow along contour line, which is very efficient in controlling erosion. So research has shown that on a bare land in Rwanda, we lost 700 ton per hectare per year on a bare land. But if we have such kind of uh, exp um, design, we reduce significantly erosion at two tons per hectare per hectare. Although agroforestry has the capacity of controlling soil erosion, yes, controlling soil erosion is not enough to transform and productive soil into productive one. This normally has come, no, I, um, there is a mistake here, I'd, I'd correct, is it 2.5 ton per hectare? So it means when soil are very acidic, like what we have here and here, even without, uh, even without uh, erosion, either under progressive terrace or bench terraces, you don't have production. Unless you bring uh, two, 2.5 uh, tons, 10 ton per hectare per year of manure and fertilizer, it's only when you do that you can uh, get production in the acidic soil of Rwanda. But all soil are not very acidic. There is some soil where you don't need lime or even fertilizer. Okay, experience uh, with conservation agriculture. Yes, as Juliet said uh, the other day, conservation agriculture in Rwanda didn't start with scientists. Even if farmer by themselves, as you can see on this good photo, they do conservation agriculture uh, intercropping. But uh, recently, Simulesa, which is a project financed by the Australian and working in East and Central Africa, uh, has introduced conservation agriculture in Rwanda. As you can see here, uh, maize, when they, it was still young, when it was maturing and uh, when mulch has a well decomposed chicken come to to have microorganism and this chain bring uh, this, uh, rotation after maize we got uh, beans and the soil does not have any sign of erosion or what is very uh, uh, is very sustainable it is the same year this is a uh, climbing bean, this is bush bean. Now, the problem of conservation agriculture, the conservation agriculture we are promoting with Simulesa is mulching, minimum soil disturbing, crop rotation. But we may also introduce efficient use of fertilizer if needed. Constant to adoption of uh, conservation agriculture is that mulching material uh, are lacking because uh, crop residues are used for many other competitive uh, use. Simulesa experiment. So Simulesa have uh, run some experiment to show uh, the difference between uh, conservation and uh, uh, tillage agriculture. And uh, it has been undertaken in different agroecological zones, three in total. And most of the time, there was no significant difference between uh, 
conservation agriculture and uh, tillage agriculture. And for this, for us, it was good news that because uh, conservation agriculture has many ecological benefit and also uh, has reduced the, the work. So the, even though the crop yield may be the same, but the profitability is not the same and the environmental benefit is not the same. So uh, we have also the option of integrating conservation and agriculture with agroforestry. And uh, this project, I think uh, my colleague, Liberal, who's coming, will present it better. Yeah. Yeah, because, it yeah, because now, if you ask where we do we go to biomass, you can get biomass on the contour line. There is a solution. So uh, there is a room of finding solution. So as a concluding remark, in Rwanda, everybody agrees that soil need organic matter and that mulching is a good option. But when you say, when you suggest that, they say where or how to get biomass. And we, we generally answer that we need to produce biomass through agroforestry. But again, they ask, they say farmers do not adopt trees on their farm. The question become, how do you introduce it? I think agroforestry, uh, like conservation agriculture, need to be introduced as in a holistic manner. You don't need to consider only trees, but you need to consider all systems that affect the household uh, environment, economic environment. We need also to integrate conservation agriculture and agroforestry system and farmer and catchment centered approach. Yeah. And finally, in this issue, biophysical environment understanding is a key. And in Rwanda, we are lucky because we are now starting a project which will construct a soil information for Rwanda meaning that we have a data to decide which kind of regenerative agriculture to introduce at any place. So with these few slides, I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pascal. This was really, uh, this was a great way of introducing uh, the work being done in Rwanda, especially from a soil scientist's point of view. And so if um, Juliet can come online, that would be great. I, I see that she is um, present. So um, Juliet, are you able to uh, come online? I see she's in the attendee list, so I'm, I'm, I don't know if we can transfer yeah, yeah, her. Yeah, I have transferred her. I think there's okay. some issue with the, uh, they're trying to promote to families. Okay, 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 I great. I think there's some issue with the connection. Because okay, okay, so maybe what we'll do is, um, Rosine, Rosine, are you on the line? <laughs> okay, there's Rosine, here's your beautiful picture. Great. So um, I will hand it over to Rosine. Rosine uh, joined a bridge to Rwanda and has been their uh, lead uh, person leading the, the Foundations for Farming program at Bridge to Rwanda. And uh, she's a graduate of Babson College in Boston. And so uh, Rosine, uh, off to you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, let me switch over to presenting mode. Um, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Rosine. And uh, yeah, I'm so glad to be with you today. Uh, let me uh, share, I'll be sharing my screen in a minute. Okay. Great. Um, Okay, so um, maybe someone can help me so that I can share. Okay, good, oh, amazing. Okay, um, can you all hear me? 
Okay, good. So we are British to Rwanda, and um, I am really so glad to hear, I mean, to uh, hear what uh, Pascal just presented and actually want to share with you the experience that we have had putting some of these things in action and uh, the strategy that we have for Rwanda in general. So my name is Rosine Lakelian Said, and I've, I'm working with British to Rwanda, um, especially Foundations for Farming, uh, where we are trying to really change the way, I mean, contribute to changing the way agriculture is done here in Rwanda and, you know, increasing, you know, organic matter and uh, carbon sequestration um, here in Rwanda. So quickly, um, uh, a little bit of, you know what, uh, I, I want to have go through um, some of the challenges that we have been facing here, uh, just to start and tell you what we have done about it. Uh, like Pascal shared, uh, we have been experiencing low yields here in Rwanda, uh, poor income for farmers, soil erosion, and more than anything else, actually we have experienced less enthusiasm for agriculture as a career for young people. Um, we here, um, it is amazing. Personally, I'm only I'm 25 years old, and uh, I don't have a background in agriculture. And every single moment that I meet people and ask me about agriculture, why I actually chose to be in agriculture, they say that I make the wrong foundations for farming. Foundations for farming uh, is an institution based in Zimbabwe, and they do conservation agriculture as a low, um, a low. Um, intense, a less capital intensive way of um, helping small farmers make a profit and increase their yields. It was developed more than 30 years ago. And since 2018, uh, when our team got trained in foundations for farming, we decided to import this program into Rwanda. Uh, so foundations for farming is purely based on like conservation agriculture technology i'll go th through this very quickly because of um what uh, has been presented before and what vj has shared with us in the past so uh we are mostly uh really promoting no plowing or minimum disturbance of the soil uh, most of our soils here in rwanda are on mountain slopes and uh tillage obviously like it has been said is increasing erosion dramatically here in the country also um the other thing that we do is using a permanent uh, planting stations, like uh, planting on uh, rows and uh, just making sure that in particular for particular plants that we can maintain those areas and disturbing the soil minimal, as minimally as possible uh, to avoid um, succession to uh, erosion. And the other thing that we do is uh, covering with the mulch. From our farms, uh, and foundations for farming in general, we are covering with the mulch just to be able to, you know, increase uh, the organic matter in the soil. Right here on the picture, you are seeing, uh, uh, right here on the picture, you are seeing uh, our farm at uh, in Kayonza, where we are using crop residues from um, our previous crop, uh, which was maize, uh, to mulch for soybeans. We have been able to see tremendous results here where we were able, for our first year actually, we were able to get um, like 1.1 uh, 1 .1 tons and then we uh, to 1.5 tons per hectare for soybeans. And then uh, in subsequent se uh, in a season after one uh, rotation, we actually had two tons with the same treatment. Um, and now it's actually going up. And so we have seen that actually practically as the soils are building themselves, as we are increasing organic matter, actually we are starting to see like some really good, um, some really good results um, uh, coming from our farms. Obviously, we have been doing this for the past uh, two or three years, but we hope to continue tracking data as to how this is improving. But we definitely have seen m amazing results uh, from both our farms as well as uh, other farms, uh, other farmers that we have uh, taught. We also are practicing crop rotation and also really teaching implementation systems that do help uh, farmers uh, be able to 
really keep this affordable. Uh, for instance, uh, when we are uh, when we are like planting, we are using like a simple rope or like a simple stick just to measure like centimeters of planting station and making sure that it's not only affordable but that it's easy to use even for people who have not gone to school or anything can be a bush actually to read and and see it. Uh, the other thing that we are using is uh, you know videos just to help people as some uh, just see how they can do it. Like for example, using a simple hole, a measuring cup for a bottle cup, people can actually be able to abide with this at low cost and then actually see the results. So you might, uh, the implementation plan that we are teaching uh, to small, uh, we are teaching with Foundations for Farming is doing things on time. Uh, here in our country, we are struggling, uh, we, we do struggle many times when uh, people don't plant on time uh, or to start preparing land right when the rains are there and plant when you know a rainy season is maybe halfway or about to end. And with climate change, uh, there have been so many issues where like the rain patterns have changed very much and so we're encouraging farmers to plan ahead uh, to prepare a farmer calendar and then start early because that reduces actually the the cost of what they are putting into the farms and uh, ensuring that they are not like burning fields or uh, using major things that destroy the soil, for example, like applying really quickly because the rainy season is on top of them. The other second thing that we are doing is uh, uh, helping people do things at the highest level of standard. Um, straight line uh, to make sure that they are using uh, really the least amount of inputs, but also for huge results. And also just to make sure that they are not disturbing the soil as they go, the same planting stations could be used next time. Uh, the other one um, is doing things with that waste. So we waste so many things, uh, the time, the soil, the water. Uh, some of the concepts really personally as an accountant have been told that all my life that land is you know an appreciating asset it really doesn't depreciate but once i you know started working in agriculture i saw that actually land can depreciate with soil erosion and burning and the more uh, actually it's depleted of you know organic matter uh, therefore uh, I have learned uh, to actually help actually farmers uh, at foundations for farming we are actually telling farmers that there is also waste of soil, uh, water, sunlight, when things are not done at the right moments. Uh, the last thing is we're teaching farmers to do this with joy. Um, one of the issues that we have currently in the country is that agriculture is, seen, is not seen as a noble profession. Many people think that it's a backward profession uh, that doesn't have money. And really, if you call a young person a farmer, it's to some extent you are really insulting them if you are saying you'll be a farmer. Uh, and so what we, what we are learning ourselves and what we are teaching others is to do this with joy. Number one, when we do it and bring results, it brings joy and we take pride in agriculture. That's what we are inspiring. So you might be wondering, uh, how is British to Rwanda uh, working to, to do this? Uh, we have two initiatives. We dedicated ourselves to being a catalyst really for change and transforming and helping Rwanda transform itself into a knowledge-based economy even when it comes to agriculture. So our first initiative is helping smallholder farmers. Uh, we want to, we are introducing these principles that we have tried on our farms for the past two years uh, to be able to learn them um, and improve their crops and uh, the environment in general and personal income. Uh, the second thing that we are doing is encouraging young people to start careers in agriculture in general. We have found that the more we actually make it appealing for young people to launch careers in agriculture, they can do it sustainably. Uh, they are actually better uh, at really changing ways of farming than people who have done it for a very long time in a, a, a specific way. And they are more prone to adopting new systems like uh, uh, conservation, agri conservation agriculture in general. So um, we are helping these young people be able uh, to, uh, 
to launch careers. And so you might be wondering, how do we do that? So for our first initiative, we're working with smallholder farmers. Uh, we are partnering with institutions that are already working with farmers. For example, uh, right now we, we are you know, we are partnering with uh, some institutions like uh, Compassion International. We're in discussions. Uh, we, are, we have talked to uh, uh, One Acre Fund, um, waiting to see uh, the, uh, the development of that relationship. We are meeting uh, farmers also in the sectors uh, where we are finding, you know, farmer champions uh, and be able to train them as trainers of trainers and they can show this in their communities. The second thing we are doing is setting up a demonstration farm where people can learn and see foundations for farming in practice. We have learned that people learn by seeing and when they see impact, they are actually more prone to changing their ways of farming. And this we have seen in in our community in, um, in Bugesera, in Nyamata, a place that is considered really a bad place for farming and that for many years has been known as an arid place where nothing can grow. But we have seen amazing results doing this type of farming, actually really replenishing the soil again. We have seen results and farmers who are surrounding us are now coming for training. So we are setting up these demonstration farms. Now we have uh, three. Uh, one is at uh, in Kayonza, uh, in Kawanjire, in the east of the country, we have another in Bugesera, down southeast. Uh, we have another one in Busogo, up north uh, in Mosonze, in the northern province of the country. That covers different agroecological uh, zones also for people to see that this is practical in every environment. Uh, lastly, we want to support the farmer champions that we train by regularly following up on them and also helping them train others. Um, so for example, on the picture here, we have uh, cooperative representatives and uh, leaders of small groups of farmers and uh, representatives of farmers from uh, from all in Yamata sector who had come to our demonstration farm to see it and harvest the maize and learn about it. So right now we'll be following up on them uh, to make sure that they are implementing them. They were so happy and we are excited that this small village, much like what we saw in Andhra Pradesh, is slowly becoming a hub for foundations for farming and conservation agriculture. The second initiative that we have is yeah, to- you could wrap up, please. Oh, okay. Uh, we are training also university graduates uh, who are coming by giving them some internship programs to help them get practical knowledge in agriculture and then be able to go and start uh, businesses in agriculture. So in general, this is what we are doing. These are some pictures from our farms. Um, what we're doing. Uh, this is uh, what is happening in our community. Actually, people that we have trained, our interns have gone and are doing this. Uh, these are some of the smallholder farmers who have done it and actually seen results and reported back to us and are teaching others. Uh, Lastly, uh, like I told you, we have some partners, foundations for farming, University of Rwanda and University of Nebraska-Lincoln, as we help repatriate talent and work with local talent uh, to increase uh, numbers of people going into agriculture. The challenges that we are facing at the moment is really scaling the FFA program to the whole country and data collection, especially for uh, follow-up systems. We would love to learn from all of you uh, how uh, some, of the, some of the things that you have been doing, especially from Andhra Pradesh, how are you following up with people? How are your data collection systems? Because we really want to build on data uh, and also scaling the farmer to uh, farmer to farmer program across the whole country. Thank you so much uh, for your attention. Um, I look forward to learning more from you. Thank you, Rosine, for an excellent presentation. Rosine is, 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 gives me hope for the future because she represents the best of what Rwandan youth is doing. She, she studied social entrepreneurship at Babson College and here she is transforming agriculture in Rwanda. And I'm very excited for how she's changing the image of what farming can represent for Rwanda and for Africa in general. So uh, I would like to know if Juliet, we can make Juliet the next presenter, if uh, the technical issues have been resolved. Always. <laughs> She's not there in the call, actually. Okay, okay. So Sam, Sam, are you available? Sam, from the from Rika.
Hello, everyone. Yes, Leanne. Okay, excellent, excellent. So, so Sam, uh, so Sam is coming to us from the Rwandan Institute for Conservation Agriculture, and uh, this is an institute that's been around for very shortly. But I will let Sam uh, talk to us and uh, give us information on RECAP. Thank you, Sam, for being here. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, thank you very much, um, and hi everyone. Uh, I'll share my screen. Okay, so I'll be really brief because what I'm going to talk about has been also touched by Pascal and Rosine in some way. So RICA, as you've just mentioned, is a very new institution. Uh, RICA stands for Rwanda Institute, Rwanda Institute for Conservation Agriculture. Uh, it's based in Ibujisera, that's in the south uh, east of the country, as you can see on the map. Uh, we are aiming to educate a new generation of future innovators and entrepreneurs. Uh, and we do it using a hands-on experiential approach. Uh, we aim to give or to offer bachelor's degrees uh, in conservation agriculture. It's a program of three years. And the students go through uh, what you call enterprises. Uh, in the ways of people, we have six of those. So people, students choose any of those. For example, raw and forage, or poultry, or swine, or uh, crops and, uh, I mean, uh, vegetables and tree crops, for example, also, or food processing. So in the end, uh, students will be entrepreneurs in those areas. We are creating people who are going to create, to create jobs, not job seekers. That's an issue we have in, in Rwanda, and I think in, in Africa in general. So our curriculum really emphasizes on conservation agriculture and one health uh, principles. Uh, and then the students uh, really understand that by learning and also by acquiring knowledge, they, they really take care of the environment or, or the soil or the, everything around them uh, through those uh, types of kinds of uh, principles, conservation agriculture and one health. So I will really skip most of my, my my slides, because I was also going to talk about conservation agriculture and what we aim to do. But uh, Pascal, as I said, Pascal and Rosina have already uh, discussed about this. So um, very quickly, you know, the principles of conservation agriculture, including minimizing tillage. That's what we, are, we adopt now. Uh, we also uh, work on maintaining soil cover through uh, cover crops, covering uh, most of our fields, uh, applying mulch. Uh, no burning crop residues, uh, or also aspects of agroforestry, including trees on farms. Also, uh, the other principle of uh, crop rotation, where uh, we also include the use of the diversified cropping systems. <clears throat> uh, well, uh, I'll mention it later, but uh, I know I've also mentioned it. We are a very young institute. So even our fields are young, we haven't really started producing much or even preparing much of our land, but we are already starting now. So some activities like crop rotation, I can say we really haven't really started because even the first production has just happened uh, with the last year's season. So, but we, those are the principles we want to adopt. In addition to, th to, to, to these three, which are mainly uh, uh, mentioned when people are talking about conservation agriculture, so, minimizing tillage. Sometimes people also mention no tillage, but ours, our philosophy is to, minim to minimize tillage. So um, in addition, we include crop livestock integration. So we are also uh, bringing in very soon cattle. So we want to make sure that to implement special appropriate cropping and livestock systems by developing and promoting these systems in a way to increase biodiversity and also to use uh, the manure uh, from the cows mainly. However, we have cows, we have swine, we have uh, lamb, we have goats, a variety of uh, animals on, on the campus. And also uh, to aim to efficiently use all byproducts from the livestock including also byproducts from food processing, because we also have that department. 
Uh, in addition, also, we aim to think of where well, we, we don't completely, uh, uh, well, e well, not using the inputs from, well, to, to increase the, the, the production. So we, our, our philosophy is to judiciously use those inputs by applying the inputs based on potential economic, uh, for economic crop response, or also by applying pesticides uh, based on the economic thresholds uh, and only as part of the integrated pest management approach. So you will see that in some cases, conservation agriculture may say, no, we don't use these or don't. So in a way or another, uh, looking like an organic farming. So we only apply where we, we think there are, there are benefits and also that we minimize any, any effect. Uh, I want also to mention that uh, we, one of the aspects we work on in this area of conservation agriculture and one half is biodiversity conservation is a big component of what we do uh, at all, our campus sits or is surrounded by a conservation area of woodland savannah of about 1000 hectare. The whole campus in fact is uh, approximately one th 100 and, and 400 hectares. So it's a big campus. But most of the size is by a woodland savanna, similar to Akajira National Park, if people have been there. And I want also to mention this that this is the second largest woodland savanna in the country after the Akajira, which is more or less intact now, less degraded. Otherwise, um, other places are smaller or highly degraded. We have also two lakes surrounding us, uh, with also Chirimbi and Garwa, people who know the place. Uh, we, uh, our area is rich in flora and fauna, uh, mainly birds, a very rapid uh, biodiversity survey last in 2018, prior to, to installation of the campus, we had invented almost 60 different species of birds and also a good number of uh, reptiles and also of, uh, frogs. We have a very nice, good microclimate because of those uh, ecosystems surrounding us also and also which offer multiple ecosystem uh, services. Currently now we are working on uh, protection and restoration plans for those natural habitats, mainly the, the, the woodland savanna around us. So this also is part of our conservation agriculture and one health approaches we are, we are adopting to, to make sure we adopt or we, we protect both uh, agro, agro ecosystems, but also uh, natural ecosystems around us. Uh, very quickly again, uh, I will only uh, mention what we, we think or what we are aiming to in terms of improving uh, livelihoods as uh, making impact to our communities, but also uh, through our students making impact globally, or I mean nationally, however, can be also be uh, globally. So we engaging our students to contribute to sustainable increase of productivity and income. Uh, first, through uh, working with local farming communities through on-site extension education. So we have a very strong education uh, extension services at our campus. At our campus, uh, we also do research, uh, but our research are informed by local needs. Uh, for example, now we are doing some uh, uh, tests in terms of soil tests or conducting surveys in the surrounding communities. So that we, as we start, as our, our students learn how to approach uh, some challenges or issues, know first or uh, focus their, 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 their find, I mean, the works or the activities based on the needs from local uh, communities. We also want to ensure that uh, the knowledge acquired is transferred to benefit uh, local communities. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying local communities because now we are starting with people, for example, in the Gashora, we have sectors around us but this will be uh, extended to the entire country. Uh, also, another impact we are looking for is to enhance climate change resilient communities. Uh, as Rosine mentioned, the Wujesera is a very, uh, well, is a tough area in terms of agriculture practice. Uh, Soils uh, and the climate conditions are, are not very favorable for, for agriculture. Uh, but then uh, with working uh, with communities, uh, but also applying the, the, the concepts of conservation agriculture mainly, we really hope to enhance climate change resilient communities 
to address challenges like drought or erosions and so forth. Uh, also, part of the benefits from conservation agriculture practices, some of those Please we, we have up. already, yes, is to reduce like, food activities costs and also uh, protection of natural resources, uh, as I was saying. So, as I'm ending, some of, of RICA experiences with conservation agriculture, one is what we have achieved so far. We are very new, we are very young. The first cohort was, the intake was in September last year. But we have already start, started implementing various demo plots. Uh, we have already uh, various crops, cover crops on, very, uh, on original poor soils, and they're doing really well. And we have already started uh, producing some vegetables and maize from those soils, and the results are very good. Uh, some challenges, however, uh, one is really the incidence of weeds. This is reported in, even in literature. So we, we are also in, in, in experiencing it at our fields, but that's, that's not really a big uh, issue because we know that uh, the first year is always like that. <clears throat> also, we think uh, through our surveys with people, we see that people, they have their mindset, the tradition of changing from traditional to conservation agriculture is still a, a long way, but to happen. Also, as Pascal mentioned, there is an issue of uh, getting enough matching material. Uh, some opportunities we have, uh, we, we are working with very interested and willing communities, which is a very good uh, opportunity for us. Also, we have collaboration and stakeholders uh, at different levels, local and international. I think, uh, I'm not sure, but Rosin will help me. I think also we are, his, his institution also works uh, with one way or another with, with RICA. As others also have mentioned, we have a very strong political will and support. And finally, uh, the most challenging thing is funds, is uh, capacity, financial capacity, which is not a problem with us, thanks to Howard G. Buffett Foundation. We are a very well-funded institution, so we hope that students will acquire high-level uh, uh, training and will be able to implement what they have acquired uh, in terms of uh, knowledge transfer and also uh, helping the communities. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam. As uh, Sam mentioned, uh, the partnership between Howard Buffett Foundation in Rwanda is a, a $500 million grant, and part of it has helped build RICA. And RICA has built using sustainable agricultural, uh, sustainable architectural practices. So, so, so we're really taking sustainability at the highest level, and Rwanda really aims to be a pioneer in green economies. And so this is why this discussion today is so urgently needed and it's so great to be uh, uh, exchanging with VJ. And thank you, Sam. I'm very excited to come and visit Rika when I'm able to come back to Rwanda soon. And so, um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. So is the Liberal available? Maybe we could have Liberal uh, join? Yes, he's there. Yes, I am. Good afternoon. Let me try to upload my slides. Uh, how do I do that? I have the slides downloaded. If you want, I can also share. All right. Um, how do I? Yeah. You can just see there's a green uh, share screen option. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, share screen. Yes. Okay. And then you have to choose the window, the first one, basically, yes, and share. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, yes thank you. Okay. Um, go. okay, oh, hang on. Yeah, so good afternoon. My name is uh, Libro Sebri Coco. I hope, no, I want to go from the beginning. Hang on. Okay, so. Uh, let me start uh, picking from where uh, Pascal left. Uh, in, my, in preparing the slides, I thought about tackling the issues from a system perspective, because you have lots of experts and agronomists around who will provide the other bits. So um, the, the pilot which we are partnering with uh, uh, in Bugesera, Oh, by the way, I'm from uh, SOS Children Villages. We, our business is around caring for children who've lost parental care, but also we prevent that by supporting families to live together. 
And uh, one of the stuff we do is, you know, uh, supporting them to enhance their livelihoods. And as many of the previous speakers mentioned, more about 70% of our people uh, live on agriculture. So definitely with my passion in ag, I had to bring it in the mix. So the pilot we started last year um, is in Bugesera. The main issue really was um, soil fertility. And um, not because the place is not fertile, but because the content of organic matter was pretty low. And that leads to low ag productivity. Um, we wanted, we introduced effective uh, land husbandry practices uh, within an integrated landscape approach. And I'll just give a few examples. Um, we uh, intended to have our beneficiaries uh, diversify their food production, um, get some meat from the animal husbandry inputs, I mean, uh, animals bought for them, uh, grow some vegetables in their kitchen gardens, and have trees and try to have some balanced nutrition, uh, make money from selling meat, which may come from where they are growing, get uh, manure um, from the cow dung and other animals they are rearing, uh, agroforestry um, to help uh, curb down erosion um, and adopt um, um, conservation through mulching. When we first visited uh, back in October, it was like a football pitch. If you go now, unfortunately, I was rushing. I didn't upload the photos. If you go now, you cannot recognize what's happening. Um, so what I learned from this, which is where I'm driving at in this um, presentation, is we have knowledge around. You know, we did not get anyone from anywhere else. The farmers did not struggle to pick the techniques and adopt, but there are a few challenges. So in the first slide, which you see here, I tried to summarize what others have talked about, and I'm trying to rush uh, to try and make my point within the 10 minutes. Um, Elian, you help me know when two minutes are left. Um, are you timing me? Good, so I have still have six. Yeah. So the first slide here really summarizes what many of my colleagues who spoke before me uh, talked about. We are in the same country, no big discoveries. Um, but for me, the most challenging part is the productivity and commercialization. You know, if we want to attract the young people in the sector, if we want to enhance and transform the sector, we have to enhance the productivity and we have to make sure that productivity does not bring problems, but brings money in. Um, and I just highlighted six causes of this limited productivity and commercialization. As I said, I'm looking at it from a uh, system perspective, um, erratic rainfall, um, this is big issue, particularly in that area where we are working. Market instability and price volatility. I guess the biggest challenge here for me is the middle people. I uh, didn't say middle men. I hope there are no women there. So the, these people who are between the farmers and the market sometimes get the best uh, out of the um, the production. Um, there was a project I was involved in a few years ago where we we're trying to see how we could reduce those middle people and try to get the farmers closer to the uh, end user supermarkets or so forth. But there's a lot of resistance because there's a group of individuals and people who are benefiting a lot from that. And that makes the farmers not to get the returns they need to get. The third cause of this low production and, uh, and commercialization, I think, is around input systems. I think those in RAB would know, you know, without, you know, um, a structured input system, you know, enhancing production is going to be hard, considering we have smaller plots which are fragmented. Uh, and then the elephant in the room, 
you know, access to finance. You know, we did not use a lot of money to push these farmers where they are today, but they cannot go to the banks or to the MFIs to get this money because the way things are structured, all these bankers are running away from these too risky uh, sector. Um, and then competition. You know, you may have some supermarkets and other hotels and so forth who may be willing, but what they are asking, the standards and specifications sometimes are too much for these farmers. And finally, value addition. I think, you know, we have a long way to go uh, in um, adding value to the agriculture, uh, primary agriculture produce. So for me, those are the, you know, the challenges I see at a strategic level. Um, whatever approach we use, if we don't solve some of these, it's going to be a bit harder. Uh, so concerns. Yeah, please uh, wrap up. Okay. Yes, quickly, I can just talk about three major concerns and, and flag that there's a lot already happening, but there are three areas where I feel we need to move. One, the pace of change is quite, you know, dizzy. And how do we cope with that pace and continue doing the good things we are doing? I try to highlight. Secondly, coordination. As I said, there's a lot of experience in the country, in the many ministries, but sometimes we are not coordinated. And finally, the ag sector is perceived as risky. How do we de risk it? How do we get financial institution to shift their focus to this sector, which is nourishing more than about 70% of our people and is the future as we've seen in, during these COVID days. Um, so that's two minutes. That's what we try to play with in that small pilot. And um, please, unfortunately, I didn't bring, I didn't put in photos because I was rushing with time for meeting where I was. Let me stop that. Do I have a minute? Thank you. Are? So, uh, yes, yes, because we'd like to make sure we have time for discussion and we, we still right. have a, a lot of speakers left. So thank you very much. This is very, very interesting, Liberal. This is exciting work and uh, um, we can talk later. There's a lot of exciting things I'd like to follow up with you. But um, so if Athanas is there, Athanas, the... Um, I'm there. Okay, yes, thank great. you, okay. Aurelia. Okay, so Athanas is here from ICRAF. He's a country lead for Rwanda. So uh, he, he's our surprise last minute speaker. So please, Athanas, uh, if you can go ahead. I don't know if you have slides. You can go ahead and share your screen. Just look at the button just next to chat. And thank you. Uh, thank you, Aurelia. Uh, I think uh, my presentation will focus on Three points, mainly I talk about the context of Rwanda, but it is already, uh, people, people already speak about, no. Wait, wait a bit. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, if you can just go okay. directly into the meat of, of your work. At okay, the I'm connecting. So I, I will talk about the context of Rwanda and then I focus on the tree fertilizer as a component of natural farming. Then I try to see uh, when you increase tree on a farm, you, you also uh, improve uh, bi biodiversity. But before that, I would like uh, probably for our colleague from India to show um, uh, to, to, to tell them about ICRAF in Rwanda. I think we have uh, 32, 32 years uh, uh, in Rwanda, and uh, from this to uh, 32 years in Rwanda, uh, we develop uh, various technology, and we start with um, uh, we start with a three seed center to provide the germoplasm to the government of Rwanda, not to import the seed, but to provide the uh, improved seed to the population to be able to promote uh, the technology. The second issue is an alert uh, is a tree for food is the erosion control. I think we develop a progressive terraces and we are happy everybody's using that in a high altitude. 
for volcanic soil where erosion is, uh, is high. And we have a sort of fertility, of course, with a fertilizer tree. And then for the tree, I think small holder don't get afford to get uh, money to buy uh, higher concentrated feed. And then we use uh, this fertilizer with higher concentration in protein to feed the cow to increase milk production and generate income. And we build also the capacity in Rwanda, I think, uh, almost more than 10 PhD. Currently, we have uh, three PhD doing their PhD here in Rwanda. And uh, I think after genocide, that is uh, a, good, a good contribution for Rwanda. So, uh, the next. The, I think the context, many people talk about it, but what I wanted to emphasize is to see this pressure of the population. Rwanda is a high populated country. Do you see the, my slide? Hello, Elian? Yes, 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 we can see your slides. Yes, they're there. Okay, Thank you. so I was saying that uh, Rwanda is characterized by higher population, and then you, when you see on your right, you can see how the deforestation was done. That is the quality, and the current is transforming in the park. And down there, you see the erosion. And the other side, you see how uh, uh, soil degradation causes the problem in terms of soil uh, fertility. You see poor maize there. And when you combine this, you come up with land degradation, food insecurity, and malnutrition. But what I wanted to say also is the effort of government of Rwanda. Government face to this problem, to this challenge, the government of Rwanda developed a program, what we call crop intensification, crop intensification program, with these different components. You have land consolidation, you have uh, improved seed, uh, to use improved seed, and the subsidy mineral fertilizer and organic matter, and you also control pests and diseases, and soil erosion control, and promote agroforestry. And you see different picture in terms of erosion. You see the two kind of type of erosion, how we control erosion, radical terraces, and you have a progressive terraces at the side. But the piece of this effort of the government, they still use in terms of uh, uh, crop yield. There is a difference, there is a still a gap between potential crop yield and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the current yield, it is uh, about 40 and 50 percent, it's very huge. So the scientists like Pascal and um, Charles Buchago, myself, we published a paper uh, showing that the uh, low level of organic matter was responsible for no response from uh, different crop for apply organic. What is the challenge for replacement of nutrient? First of all, is continue mining the soil. The fertilized soil can become infertile. If you continue to dig the soil to uh, make inappropriate uh, agronomic practice, you reduce the capacity of the soil to support the crop, then it becomes infertile. So there is also a source of organic matter. So there is a competition between livestock, between organic matter, and as you know in Rwanda, in one season we grow three crops, maize, potato, and, and beans, and each crop needs organic matter. So when we don't have enough space, you know that uh, each farmer has 0.5 hectare, which is not enough. So farmer will grow one cow and it can produce enough manure to fertilize uh, all of these different crops. So there is also poverty, which, uh, smallholder cannot invest to get to buy seed for fertilizer tree and to, to improve his, his land. So, uh, and uh, here I wanted to introduce the fertilizer tree as a big component in natural farming system. As you know, fertilizer tree, I didn't go through the definition, but the most, most benefits that the fertilizer tree give, we have it fixes nitrogen up to 150 aluminosa go above, and it can also uh, uh, it can also uh, capture the nutrient uh, reached uh, around 42 kg of nitrogen per hectare, and also progressive terraces can control soil erosion around 60 and 80 percent, and at the same time you use the green manure to improve your soil fertility. For example, one PhD student found that beans can be increased by applying 
a green manure by 30, between 13 and 33 percent, while for potato you can go up to 55 percent in this quarter area. So, and also these three are associated with mycorrhiza, and mycorrhiza allow availability of nutrient and benefit to associate crop. And the other side, you see the huge biomass of Arunosite acuminata in the incorporation. And down here, you see uh, we plant uh, uh, Grevisidia, but with different species to see how much biomass it can produce. You see the alone stand, it can produce more, but with a spacing of C meter, when you use intercropping, you can also get higher biomass in, in the land. Another advantage for a tree, when you talk about uh, mulching, we, it, the tree in, in, in the land, during the dry season, they recover the land and they keep the moisture and then during the dry season, the, 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 the soil are not affected by the stress, by the stress due, to, due to solar, so radiation. And that is, I try to show the potential of organic sources, nitrogen fixation in a small holder farmer, in a farmer, in ordinary farmer. You see, we have a different species, Caliandra rhinos, and the- I'll need you to wrap up, please. Okay, to the flows here, and then you have that. So you have here also, when you have a tree on farm, there is also management is very important. Otherwise, there will be competition. You see like this pruning uh, uh, Graveria lobista. No pruning, you see how much litre per day it consume. But when you prune, you see how it reduces the consumption of water and the, the crop can use it. And here I wanted to talk about the biodiversity link tree on farm with biodiversity. On axis X, you have a number of tree species on the farm, and then here you have a number of birds. You see the correlation is very positive, and it attracts many birds. When you increase the tree on the farm, you attract many birds. That is a tool we are using currently to show the evidence to the people who say that, that increase the tree on the farm is not a, a good business. It's a good business because you have the bed, you have insects, you have the microorganisms, which facilitate the pollinization of different crops. And here you have a different species. Down there you have a number of tree species and we have a number of beds. And you see there is a mix of species, meaning exotic and indigenous species, and the, 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 the green. And here you have the number of beds which increase when you have a mixture with exotic and the indigenous, and then you have indigenous species. So in conclusion, fertilizer tree have a great potential in a natural farming because half of biomass is organic carbon, and also the other nutrient, and also microorganism activity particular. And also it is an opportunity to reduce the cost of mineral fertilizer. Uh, but we need also to increase the scale gap for large adoption. The bird prefer area with indigenous and mixed species. To design agroforestry inter intervention, it can facilitate, can influence bird richness. Some challenges, the challenge we have uh, currently, which uh, I don't know, uh, is control pest and disease, is in this natural farming system. If we can come up with uh, something natural to control that, that can be good. And also, we recommend to increase tree on the farm for improving above and below ground biomass for making soil health, for making activity. But we need more research to improve further natural farming system. Like phosphorus, you know, is not fixed by another tree. Even mycorrhiza can mobilize more, but we need to to, to do more research to, to increase in the system of phosphorus. Thank you very much, uh, Lillian, and you have a link and the other thing behind. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, we, we, we're going to have some uh, closing remarks. Uh, we will start with uh, Prime, the uh, Director General of the Rwanda Water Board. Is Prime available? Yes, I, yes, I am. Okay, great, great, great. So welcome, welcome. Uh, hi, uh, Elian Hello. and the other. Thank you. Hello. Yes, we okay. can hear you well. Yes. 
Okay, okay. It is a pleasure for me to be with you today, this afternoon, to, to share with you this uh, new institution. Uh, the, uh, today, me, I am going to, it is a, a kind of advocacy of the new institution recently established to overcome those uh, uh, multiple issues related to water, which is uh, affecting our agriculture productivity and also our economy. Hello? Yeah, we're here. We, we can hear you. We can hear you very well. Uh, le, le, let me put my, my presentation. Okay. Uh, Okay, we can see your screen. Perfect. Hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you and we can see your screen. So you can start. Go ahead, please. Uh, okay, thank you. As uh, I said, the Rwanda Water Board uh, was established very recently in this uh, uh, January. January this year, it was uh, uh, to come to solve different issues uh, related to our country, related to the water resources. As you know, uh, our country is a hilly country, a hilly slope, uh, with uh, almost, uh, I can say, uh, with uh, our population density, which lead to the lack of follow in agriculture. Uh, there are uh, those uh, issues of climate change with a high uh, rainfall intensity with a long period. I can say that uh, from uh, this year, uh, the Rwanda recorded uh, the high intensity over recorded uh, during the last 30, 30 years. So the Rwanda decided uh, to establish this in, this new institution to overcome the issue of uh, erosion, which is affect, affecting very highly our agriculture, our infrastructure, our human being. It was established also to overcome in the future time the issue of uh, water storage per capita, which is uh, till now very at a low rate compared to the international standard. As you see, uh, now we are, uh, I can not say that we are at the starting level, we are trying to, to protect our country, uh, starting to our high risk zone. Uh, according to our survey, to our technical assessment, we have uh, around nine agroecological zones. Uh, among them, six are uh, at high risk zone. Now we are trying to see how we can uh, protect those uh, watershed. We are uh, on baseline of four. Uh, we expect uh, that with uh, the winning of our government uh, in uh, seven years uh, of our NST1, uh, the, the high risk zone will be protected. Uh, uh, Parallelly with uh, soil erosion, because uh, in protecting a uh, high risk zone, protecting erosion with the ap appropriate agriculture practices, which I am saluting uh, your good initiative of, of introducing and uh, put uh, the high emphasis on uh, uh, good uh, agriculture practices like uh, this uh, agriculture, like uh, this uh, technique of uh, conservation of agriculture. The other issue which uh, this uh, institution should do to overcome is to ensure the enough and the appropriate water capacity, water storage in terms of capacity and also in terms of quality. This means to the improvement of our, our local or international uh, young people in a 
related to the capacity building of, of techniques and the appropriate and the modern, uh, modern techniques of water management. Uh, as you see, we are, uh, we are not starting by zero for our catchment rehabilitation. Uh, this is a catchment level one and the level two, those who are specialized or who have knowledge in the uh, land husbandry, they understand what it means. We are trying to, 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 we are trying to, to increase the water capacity. If we, we, we do a technical survey, now we, ha we have uh, currently around uh, 40 million cubic meters of water stored. Now, very soon in this October, November, we are starting a construction of a multi-purpose dam, which will come to solve the, the issue of water, water supply in, for around 30, 30, 30, 30, 30 uh, thousand of household, which will be supplied which will be supplied with uh, clean water, potable water, uh, which will, this multi-purpose dam will, uh, will uh, provide uh, electricity uh, and also it will uh, supply water for irrigation uh, at around 10,000 hectares, which will be under irrigation using this uh, multi-purpose dam. It is a, a multi-purpose dam which will be uh, funded by Government of Rwanda in collaboration with the African Development Bank. So this is a, 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 the different in, initiative for water storage and the other, other project which will be starting very soon. Uh, those who know very well Rwanda, uh, we are trying to, to increase the area covered by uh, soil erosion infrastructure, soil erosion control infrastructure, those uh, are different radical terraces. Uh, and the other side, we are looking for other progressive terraces. Mr. Athanas was uh, saying uh, about agroforestry and the uh, other good practices. The, this uh, institution, uh, it, it is a, a cross-cutting institution. It is regarding agriculture. It is uh, touching the infrastructure in the road construction in a bridge construction. It is regarding also in a, in a building construction for water harvesting and the water storage. It is regarding also health, health sector for to ensure that our population is uh, with enough and the clean water for to have a good health with the potable water. So, Besides those uh, good initiatives of uh, our country, we are facing uh, to a huge uh, issue related to our history, related to our, our situation. Our, even if uh, you know our, our country is uh, depending to agriculture product, production at uh, around 70%, uh, let's take that. Uh, looking at different assessment, eh, there is a, a huge difference between the input in the water used in the agriculture and the, its productivity. So this uh, institution will try to make a balance between the input in terms of water and the productivity gain from agriculture. It will, the other challenge, which is a very very capital is to increase the water storage per capita. Now we are at, at around, around the uh, six, uh, 70% of our cons water consumption while we want to be with the NST 120, 24 at 100%, meaning that it should do, whole country should be with the appropriate, clean, and the enough quantity water for the whole population and the, in all sectors. But this is, it is a huge, it is a long journey, and it is a very hard, which means there is a, a need of to put all the effort 
from agriculture, from infrastructure, from health, from also uh, local communities. There is uh, also issue of uh, erosion, which is a very a big problem for our agriculture production and the productivity. Sorry. Uh, if I try to show a bit, that is, uh, you see that agriculture consumption in water is uh, more than 96%. The remaining sectors of, uh, of, uh, of the country, there are, there are, there are with only uh, a, a bit less than 4%, which means this productivity of agriculture it is generating only a less than a third of what we are expecting from agriculture, which meaning that the sector of agriculture is, is requested to increase their effort, even if they are doing our, their best. Uh, it is a, there is a long journey, there is a hard journey, because uh, all Rwandans, all or uh, neighboring uh, countries are relying on agriculture, meaning that there is a, a big effort which is needed for to increase this, this uh, productivity. And for Rwanda Water Board to ensure that the water for to be used in agriculture is uh, relatively enough. Uh, this is a, a picture showing if there is uh, nothing done, uh, we can we can be uh, in disaster in the in uh, a short time. This is uh, due to the mining issue, uh, due to inappropriate uh, agriculture practices, uh, due to over -explo exploitation of uh, farmland, and uh, due to the other behavior which should do be changed. This is uh, our target. This is uh, our mandate to decrease at zero rate those uh, kind of sedimentation or the, these uh, kind of uh, siltation in our water body or our rivers. Uh, our expectation uh, for this uh, smart agriculture is uh, to contribute to reduce uh, as much as, as possible the rate of erosion which are affecting our river, which are affecting our lakes, is also to try to decrease as much as possible the sedimentation and to avoid those budget which are allocated to maintenance of hydropowers, those budget which was supposed to be used in other economic sectors, it is also to increase the infiltration of our soil, to increase the water holding capacity, and also to, to increase our productivity. Uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. It was a, a brief, uh, a brief share of our, our new institution. It is a new institution which come from different institution which was established to overcome, uh, to bring solution to the issue of erosion control, increase the water storage per, per capita, and also to try to increase the agriculture productivity through different techniques. Uh, Madam thank you. Elian, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. This was very exciting to learn about this new institution in Rwanda. Uh, clearly, uh, this is going to be very important in our discussion. So we, we may extend a little bit so we make sure that we have enough time for the discussion period. So for any of you who can stay a bit longer because it's going to be very important. So many things have come up already in terms of the um, the, the issues that uh, I know Ravi and uh, Walter are going to be uh, responding to, as well as Vijay. We still have two uh, remarks from uh, the um, Deputy uh, uh, Executive uh, Director of the, the Rwanda Agricultural Board and the uh, Director General. So uh, Charles and Patrick, if you could give your brief closing remarks so we, we can uh, finish this part of the uh, event and we can go on to the discussion with Vijay uh, 
Walter and Ravi, that would be great. Okay, so Charles, Charles, are you available? Yes, I'm there. Okay, okay, wonderful, wonderful, Charles. So, so thank you very much, uh, Elian and and the colleagues. Uh, I'm I'm very sorry I couldn't be there yesterday, and uh, I'm currently in the Eastern Province attending an important meetings. But I managed to spare a bit of time to follow the discussions. I don't have uh, any presentations, but uh, I can share a few few remarks uh, from what we have been doing. Uh, I'm, I'm actually agroforester by training. So I have been working on uh, issues regarding tree technologies, working with the farmers across the country, but in a more farming systems approach. I was very much excited to hear from our colleagues, uh, Dr. Atanas and uh, Pascal and the others who have uh, shown some of the research findings that have uh, be, been achieved uh, and uh, uh, extensive research has been done in uh, organic uh, fertilizer, organic matter in this country. And the issue here is about a shortage of organic matter, which is a, really one of the limiting factor in agricultural pro production. Uh, I would emphasize more discussion on, on the issue of shortage of organic matter in more in a soil uh, acidity uh, with the soil acidity in the southern western part of this country. We have more than 50% of our country actually facing a very challenging soil acidity uh, problems. And without organic matter uh, level, acceptable level of organic matter, it means the fertilizer that are being applied are not actually being properly captured and the, and the, and the farmer and the, and the plant be able to benefit of it. Because if you have a, a, a heavy or severe soil acidity and we have a heavy rains, it means the, the, the soil nutrient can be not be, be captured and do, not be held so that the plant uh, benefit of it. And this is very challenging. So in our research uh, that we do at RAB, but also in collaboration with other uh, partners, we are looking at how we can uh, have alternative material to supply organic matter in our soil. So in that context, we are talking about, we are looking at how do we capitalize on, on farm manure? You know, uh, manure coming from cows is a very potential uh, uh, source of uh, nutrient, but also uh, application of farm uh, manure in the soil increase, uh, improve the soil structure, and then can also uh, retain soil moisture in a, in, a, in, a, in a soil. But the challenge with the farm manure is that we don't have enough and it's for, for the soil really to, to be, uh, to provide enough nutrient, but also to improve soil and nutrient, uh, soil uh, structure, we need a minimum of tons, 10 to, 15, uh, 10 to 15 tons per hectare. And which is not uh, material is not uh, easy to get especially on the various farms where we don't have enough biomass. Uh, so reason why we, we turn to other technology like uh, agroforestry, agroforestry or tree technology that uh, Dr. Atanas has developed. And we are looking at multipurpose trees in this context. So if a farmer wants to convince a farmer to plant a tree, a farmer is not looking at uh, trees as a potential, as a trees as a provider of organic matter only, but he will, the farmer will also look at other, uh, other, uh, other purposes, like uh, trees be able to provide the stakes, be able to provide the fewer woods, or to, to provide erosion control services, like uh, what uh, DG Rwanda Water Board has just developed. So tree uh, and the agroforestry is a very ancient uh, practices. It's, it's, 
is, is well known in Rwanda even before the colonial era, which means is a very uh, technology that can be very adopted by, by farmers who farmers are familiar with, with trees and management of trees, and they're very easy to disseminate as a technology. So we have done a bit of uh, extensive research in agroforestry, purposely looking at how, which tree technology for specific needs of the farmers. In other words, how do we match the agroforestry technology to the very specific biophysical, by, but also social economic condition of the farmers? So, so uh, issues here uh, we have been uh, looking at is to, to see what the farmers are prefer, farmers' preferences with regard to agroforestry and to see which technology should be proposed or disseminated depending on the different agroecological zones. So these, these, the, the, these are issues that we have developed as a part of our, our research at the doctoral level, but we're trying now to integrate in what we do at RAB, where we implement the crop intensification program since 2007. It's actually a program that uh, promotes use of in, uh, agriculture input, uh, but also providing extension uh, services, but also other technology like irrigation, mechanization, with a purpose to increase the productivity. In other words, we try to bring on board all the technology, all the good practices that are needed for the, our agriculture to be transformed from subsistence to commercial. Because when you talk about commercial agriculture, we're looking at the economic of scale, we're looking at the practices agriculture at large scale, at least one hectare, but make sure we get the maximum out of this soil. Because our, our shortage of land requires us to do intensification to produce more on a, a, a small pieces of land. And uh, there is a very uh, amazing uh, uh, achievement that you have achieved since 2008, seven, seven where uh, maize yield and um, priority crops uh, have ac achieved actually increase in the productivity of five times for the maize, but also for cassava and the other crops. We have uh, uh, increased, managed to increase the productivity by several folds. So these say that, uh, of course, research would continue, specifically looking at where we have uh, yield gap, what the factor that de determine or limiting factor of productivity on individual uh, farms. Uh, of course, we have what you call consolidated land as part of crop intensification program. We try to bring together all small pieces of uh, land owned by small holders and making it a bigger unit try to intensify on a bigger land so on that those specific consolidated land we are able to multiply productivity by several times but currently the uh, more more farmers have not yet joined the co the, co the, the consolidated area which means we are progressively bringing those farmers that are cultivating on small pieces into the scheme of consolidation, which means we are trying to see what are the limiting factor on this uh, scattered land, and you try to optimize productivity at this, uh, at this, uh, at this uh, land. So as part of what we do at RAB, we also have a project with the funding by Gates Foundation. We are starting this year. Talking, uh, uh, working on, on, on Gwasis, Rwanda Soil Information Systems, where the main issue here is the looking at uh, the, the, this, the, the fertilizer recommendation for different soil and the different crops. Because as you know, crops, re nutrient requirements are different. We have a, vari a diversity in terms of uh, uh, altitude in terms of soil nature in this country, and uh, responses to fertilizer is, is, is different from one uh, location to another. So in this project, we are looking at how we can uh, 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 determine 
the, 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 the correct rate, fertilizer rate to individual location depending on the specific conditions. Of course, in this uh, project, we are looking at the integrated uh, crop soil nutrient uh, uh, approach, looking at how organic fertilizer can be also used with the, in the, uh, uh, mineral fertilizer, look at how we can increase efficiency by combining these different resources. So finally, I want to highlight the uh, importance of research at RAB that we are doing, where we are looking at uh, agriculture as a system with a different component and look at the use of uh, soil uh, uh, agriculture modeling tools, because we believe these are very complex systems that need different component that use of uh, support decision making uh, tools like modeling, crop modeling, soil modeling, integrated modeling tools may play a bigger role and a very useful in, uh, tools that you can use to determine, the, to, the, to, to target the correct technology to be applied uh, in the individual farms that we have in this country. And we are looking at the partnership with, the, with different uh, uh, people, CGR, agricultural Inst institution, development partners. So, so we, 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 we think we are open to any collaboration partnership that will help us to keep increasing productivity. As I said, we have achieved a lot, but we still have a gaps in terms of productivity to be filled. So thank you very much. That is what I had to share. But also I'll have to apologize because I'll, I'll actually have to join another and another meeting. But uh, thank you very much, Elian, for organizing this meeting. And uh, we look forward for continuing this partnership. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. It's, it's really a pleasure to have you uh, uh, as the Deputy Director General of RAB to be joining us today. Uh, I don't know if Patrick is available. Um, Patrick uh, had stepped out for a minute. Uh, if Juliet can just give us a brief remarks, maybe a, just a minute or two. I know that we've had technical difficulties, but um, if Juliet can join, that would be great. Just to briefly uh, uh, just say hello. Uh, if not, oh, Charles is here. Great. Okay, so Charles, uh, please go ahead and give us the closing remarks, and then we can move on to the discussion session. If if Juliet can come and join the discussion session, that would be great. But so go ahead, Charles. Sorry. <laughs> Charles, so we can go ahead, please. For what? Uh, for so, so, Charles, did, just did you can you give us some closing remarks, to, just some final thoughts before we initiate the discussion? Uh, okay. Um, just brief. Did you, you, doesn't need to be more than a minute. Just, just, just. Well, uh, my final remarks is just to for, to thank the organizers, mm -hmm. of course, uh, Elian. Uh, and colleagues are very, uh, very, uh, very uh, thankful about what uh, this initiative and bringing together people discuss about the these important issues of uh, organic farming and uh, and uh, and uh, as Rab, of course, and uh, we are going to continue working together. Uh, I was not able to follow all the discussions, but I. I would request we, uh, the material, the discuss, uh, presentation be shared. Yes, absolutely. And I, I hope to be able to, to, to follow up on this. And uh, as I said, uh, at RAB, we, we, we really want to, to have this partnership. Uh, Rwanda is a country with the, uh, is actually, we, we do a, a, a organic farming, but naturally, we, farmers are actually practicing organic farming without knowing, uh, because we, we, we apply less fertilizer in this country, and we also need to capitalize on available resources to be able to increase the productivity. So briefly, I want to thank the organizers, but also to to highlight our, our willingness, our, our will to continue working together 
for the, the, the prosperity, but also the, 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 the target to increase the livelihood uh, of our country, or our, our farmers community, but our population, Rwanda uh, population at large. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charles. This was deeply appreciated to have you with us today as uh, the uh, Director General of RAB. And so- but, uh, uh, Patrick is back. Huh? <laughs> okay, oh, Patrick is here? Okay. Yes. Okay, okay, yes. okay, Patrick. Okay, go ahead, Patrick. Okay, thank you, Eliane. Sorry, I have just lost connection. Yes. Because uh, I have a low battery. And um, so, but now I'm back connected. Okay. Yeah, thanks, apologies for that. So. I'm, I'm very pleased to be with you all of you guys and the, 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 the colleagues in Asia and the, the, team, the different colleagues. It was a very, very, very fantastic presentations. Uh, this is an area where the area that is quite less known here, this area, this topic of uh, zero uh, farming, I mean, you know, zero input or much more conservative agriculture. It's something people we are trying to learn more and more about that. They are excited to know more about that. So far, because of, um, because of our, the, the challenges that are particular to this country of um, high population density, limited land, it's, you know, and very, very, very fragmented uh, small holdings. As you know, uh, Rwanda is the it is actually the most densely populated country in mainland Africa. And uh, the land holdings on average is, the, is below 0 0.5, 0 0.5 hectare uh, a farmer, very, very small scale holders. And uh, I'm consider in face of the challenges of increasing our productivity, that has have been very well explained by um, several speakers uh, about the context of Rwanda. The government uh, puts forward, emphasizes more uh, in, in our policies, the, the, uh, the, the consolid land use consolidation, but also intensification to maximize production over a small land, to get most over the small land. And uh, among our main strategies for increasing productivity is mostly uh, to try to push for increased use of inputs um, where under the national strategy for transformation we aim to achieve uh, at least uh, 75 kilogram per hectare of fertilizer use and uh, uh, several of the previous people did, did very well mention, very important, that uh, this has to be in an integrated uh, farming system. We try to improve the soil, uh, the, 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 the organic matter in the soil to, to reduce, to fight soil acidity with liming and to reduce erosion and many other stuff. So when we talk about the uh, approaches like uh, like less use of fertilizer and the more conservative agriculture and things like permaculture, natural farming. I have to say that usually it's not very very much uh, perceived as uh, as uh, as, uh, as, uh, as something will help us to overcome these problems here. Uh, we have to learn more about that. Uh, we, we, the tendency to think, is to think that uh, we must get there with increasing use of inputs that we are using much less. So I'm very happy to have on, uh, in this uh, uh, platform uh, experts, colleagues in Asia who have seen this, uh, this paradigm uh, working so that we can learn from them. Uh, in any case, we would not just start to embrace this immediately and say, hey, all farmers, just do this. We will need to be convinced practically. We need to have a demonstration. I highly appreciated uh, Rosine's presentation. You know, there, there, there are some very good stuff going on around here sometimes that we don't know. Uh, I will really need to visit that. 
I, I think I have also heard of another uh, another organization which I'm looking forward to visit, which is doing that. So in, in brief, is we have challenges to increase our production productivity, and so far we believe mostly in fertilizers here in agriculture policy at the leadership of agriculture sector of this country. We believe more in use in of inputs. And uh, we, uh, we, we, it, we need to be convinced that uh, things which tend to be natural or less, less inputs can still help us to, uh, to achieve, to, uh, to circumvent these challenges. I didn't have a chance to hear from the colleagues in Asia. I'm very eager to hear from them. And uh, what matters for us is the art of outcome and what works. If you guys convince us, we will just go, go on it. Um, uh, it would be great if we can achieve uh, what we are, want uh, to nourish our people and also agriculture to serve uh, the industry, to serve um, you know, to, to a springboard for, for transformational growth of, uh, of economy. So, so, so it would, it would be great to to have these insights. We we are very very much eager to learn more about this, and we will be very pleased to pilot on some scale to, and to, to 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 invite the farmers and other stakeholders to see themselves that this is working, and then we will be very pleased to upscale when we get really we are convinced beyond doubt that this is working. Yeah, but at least uh, uh, so far, this whenever we go into into such this um, platforms where we discuss that, we usually that's usually our our point, our, our what we put forward in the ministry, in the rub, in the leadership of our culture sector. Thank you, colleagues, and I'm very happy to be with you and to keep interacting and to learn more, and we'll be very pleased to uh, also answer any you know need for more information. We'll be very happy to provide. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Patrick. This was a, a really wonderful way to, to, to uh, open up the discussion period. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to maybe uh, just let Vijay uh, start the response and then we'll have Ravi and Walter also contribute. There's so much that has been brought to the table and uh, I know there's exciting uh, responses. So please Vijay, uh, please uh, unmute yourself and uh, initiate uh, uh, dialogue on all the points Patrick has shared and everything else before. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. And uh, thank you, Patrick. I think you, you summed up the position very well. What are the concerns of the government of Rwanda over uh, food security, productivity, farmers' welfare, the issues of erosion, etc., and whether natural farming can address that. I think that's a good challenge you have uh, given. And uh, uh, hopefully, we should have uh, another uh, meeting to, you know, discuss each of these uh, issues. Uh, but, and also, I'm very impressed with the presentations uh, colleagues from Rwanda have made. My congratulations to all of them. And uh, uh, those on the ground, like Rosine, Sam, and Liberal, uh, you know, have really inspired us that, uh, you know, to see such good work happening. Even though it's early work, still, uh, you know, some more time has to elapse, but I think you're on the right track. Uh, I, what I would like to do is I would actually like Ravi now to uh, make his intervention and then uh, followed by Walter. And then I will take up issues, you know, around uh, scaling up, around extension, around women's collective. But uh, I would, uh, you know, like uh, uh, Ravi to come in first. Ravi? Thank you for being here, and uh, and this is your uh, you know familiar beat. I mean, this is a craft uh, at its best in Africa. Uh, Ravi, please go ahead. Um, yeah, thanks, Vijay, and uh, thanks, Elian, and 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 colleagues. Um, it was great to hear uh, everybody. Um, you know, fantastic work going on. Um, there was nothing to disagree with. Um, you know, it's it's great at when you come to the end of something and you say, ah, I do, you know, I really think somebody's you know barking up the wrong tree. There were no wrong trees. In fact, as a 
as somebody from Mikraf, I was very pleased to see how many trees there were in the in the presentations. But we know that we know that by and large, you know, uh, the thinking is is, is screwed on correct um, in Rwanda. There's two issues that I'd like to focus on, um, and one I suspect um, uh, Vijay will do more with, and I know uh, Walter will talk a, a lot more about um, sort of um, the issues of um, soil and soil microbiota. So um, I'll keep my remarks fairly broad. What I uh, what I heard, and I think Rosine uh, uh, was the the one who who picked it up strongest, but it was echoed throughout. Um, um, we've got to make agriculture a much more attractive business for the younger people, and uh, so I want to focus a bit on that. Um, and and the challenge with the concept of natural farming often is, oh my goodness, this is going up, going back to what great grandfather used to do. Um, you know, they're not. They don't want to use pesticides or fertilizers or any of the, these modern things. Um, and I, I think Pascal, in his uh, definition of natural farming, didn't suggest that. But he said it was going to be no pruning and no tilling. And you know, uh, no. I think uh, and Vijay will speak to what uh, natural farming is and what it isn't. Um, I I think we need a massive paradigm shift in agriculture. Uh, and I, I think it was uh, uh, Patrick who was saying that he wanted to hear from, uh, and I really appreciated both Charles and Patrick's um, uh, uh, closing remarks. I thought they were really, really useful. The Asian colleagues. Well, um, I am both an Asian colleague and you know, with my headquarters in Nairobi, I'm also an African colleague, but let me just take the perspective as somebody from India um, to talk about what has happened as a result of the Green Revolution and why we have to be very, very careful about it in Africa. In the centers and the cradles of the Green Revolution in India, the excessive use of inputs, water, pesticides, fertilizers, has created a dependency syndrome, which is very much alike to somebody who's a heroin addict needing more and more of the drug. So what you have in the, um, in the uh, Ganges uh, uh, and Indus deltas um, is um, surface groundwater dropping to, uh, to about 200 meters below surface. And what they're now pumping up is water laced with arsenic and pumping it into their fields, because that is what the water is. They, they're extracting it at that level. The, the, the excessive use for uh, synthetic fertilizers and pesticides has killed soil biota, which essentially means soils are not responsive. And one of the uh, uh, presenters spoke about that as a natural phenomenon in Africa. We don't want to exacerbate that. So excessive use of water, fertilizers, and pesticides. The health impacts on this on farming communities is enormous. So there's a lot of uh, pesticide poisoning uh, taking place in those uh, uh, farming communities. And uh, drinking water is laced with excessive use of, of uh, uh, nitrates, um, which is also affecting things like fertility, um, health, etc. So we need to look at what the Green Revolution did, which was give a lot of calories to people, not necessarily nutrition, but you know, increased productivity at a cost. And when we take this to Rwanda, we need to do that without the cost. And, and so, you know, I think both Patrick and Charles are right to be, uh, to say, in the interest of Rwandan farmers and Rwandan people, we're interested to look at natural farming. What can it give us? What it can't? Because we have to make decisions on behalf of people. I would ask that you make the same kinds of decisions about um, what, uh, what the promise of the Green Revolution is. There is a recent report on the on the work of Agra, and everybody um, uh, in Rwanda knows what Agra is all about. Um, and the results are pretty damning in terms of the use of a green revolution approach in Africa. So I think when we talk about, particularly in uh, complex uh, environments, uh, what do we do about agriculture? We've got to work with nature, not against nature. I think the principles of agroecology are going to help us there. I'm pretty agnostic whether we add fertilizer or not. Vijay will vehemently say no synthetic fertilizers. And if you can get away with that, that saves the farmers money. And we've seen that there's a real benefit to it and it saves the soils. But, you know, there may be uh, situations where you add. I wanted to speak about youth and Ilian also about digital. 
because I think this is where the promise is. Um, and uh, I think uh, Charles was speaking about RASIS, um, which is the so soil information system, which is based on technologies that ECRAF developed and, and shared, um, which are digital technologies. I think there's a whole, we are dealing, if we take um, the ecology and nature as our starting point, not um, you know a substrate and then you add all the inputs you want, then you need advanced uh, science. You need um, a lot of complexity to be understood before you can work on that. And that is challenging and will require um, a new crop. Uh, Africa used to, the brightest and best in Africa uh, in the 60s and the 70s went into agriculture. Uh, and, uh, and today, as, as many of the younger folk uh, uh, have identified, they don't go in any longer. And so we have that credibility gap. But when you put these interesting challenges in front of them and the kinds of technologies that we're starting to use, drones, sensors, satellite imagery, big data uh, uh, platforms, analytics, at least on the science side, you'll attract people. For the younger people, we have to increase, incre increase dramatically the value coming off the land. And here we've got to think in terms of value webs and moving up the value ladder. There is no point for Rwanda to basically be producing maize of 0.5 hectares. It has the climate and the soils to produce high value crops. Where you can uh, have larger, larger areas, by all means produce subsistence crops. But to expect farmers to grow subsistence crops and get out of poverty is like expecting somebody who's uh, digging a hole uh, um, to, 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 to reach for the sky when he's going in the opposite direction. So I think we need to look at the value web and change what is being produced off the land. Um, ICRAF has great success in, uh, with tree tomato, for instance, and massive increases. Um, Walter, you'd be interested in an Australian funded project um, in farmer income by shifting to high value crops that are much more sustainable because they are permaculture. So I think there are things that we can do that will attract the youth back. Then there's the issue about the web itself, processing. It's not just about digging with a hoe, it is about taking the products off the land and turning them into uh, processed products, which Rwandans, the region and the world wants. Everybody in the world wants safe, healthy food. Rwanda can produce that food at a price. Charge your price. So I'm going to stop there. Think about value webs and digital and uh, advanced science to bring the youth back. Think about stepping up from where you are in subsistence crops to high value crops. And by the way, uh, lots of people have been talking about agroforestry. I'm really pleased. Rwanda is one of the cradles of it. But agroforestry is not just trees. It's the integration of trees, crops, and livestock. And I haven't heard enough about that in integration and energy story that is also critical. So we need the people. We need energy. We need the economics. And then I think the sky's the limit because, you know, uh, uh, Rwandan folk that I have met are incredible. Yeah, not just my friend and colleague, Athanas, but everybody I've met. So, you know, you are an incredible people. You can get it done. Let me stop there. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, may I now request Walter to respond to the, what he has heard from Rwandan colleagues? Walter, I know it's yes. great for you in Australia. Really grateful to you for, uh, you know, sparing oh. the time. Vijay, never too late. And look, thank you very much, everybody. And yes, very interesting. Uh, I've been in this game of tropical agriculture right from the 70s when I started. So it's not new to me, but it's really significant, the challenges that we face. And I just wanted to make a couple of key points Obviously, there's a lot of detail and we're very happy to, to take the questions on board and then to come back with specific answers, but just highlighting some key points. Now, the first thing is, of course, it's land. Again, and this land, the limited land you have, particularly in Rwanda, for your population is absolutely precious. And so protecting that land and avoiding its erosion and stabilization is critical. And so the idea, and this comes back to what we talked about on Monday, 
if we're going to have bare soils vulnerable to erosion, that is exactly what we mustn't do. So we've got to get from that 90% red or brown that you're seeing through the landscape to say, how do we have 100% green? How do we have 365 days green plant cover protecting those soils? And the nice thing is we have the solutions, both in terms of the agroforestry, you know, how can we use trees, deep roots, anchoring soils, particularly once you get over 5% slopes. And of course, that's a lot of Rwanda, but also what Vijay has been demonstrating in Andhra Pradesh, pre-monsoon dry seeding. How do we go in and actually put a green protective cover crop across the whole landscape continually? And how do we use that in Rwanda to actually help stabilize those soils? But then as basically we just, Ravi just said, integrate basically cropping into that cover, integrate grazing into that cover, use it under agroforestry. So we're again having an integrated protective system. So, but we can come back with more details on how that might be done. The second thing I wanted to mention is, it was raised by Patrick and others, the issue of actually biofertility or the yield gap. And also the question about, okay, how are we getting nutrients being available? What do we have to do? And clearly, as we lose organic matter from our soil, the availability of nutrients goes down enormously because the roots, but particularly the fungi that are important for taking them up, can't access them. And so the whole biofertility challenge of soils is to enhance their availability, which again comes through what Eliana has sort of also mentioned, the need to bring that organic matter content up. Because if we don't do that, we're going to have acidification and we're going to have then toxic effects like aluminium coming into solution when the acidity goes too low. So it's really critical from the biofertility point of view to build that up. Now, Rwanda soil have got enough nutrients in them. They're very rich organic soils, but what we've got now, we've got in a sense degraded subsoils and 90% of the aval of the nutrients that are in those soils aren't being made available because of that structural problem. So building that organic matter content is critical, which is then the next point we want to address. Yes, we must build it, but we're not going to be able to build organic matter in these tropical soils just by mulching. 90% of the carbon that we add when we mulch just simply gets oxidized to CO2 and goes back into the air. As Vijay said on Monday, the critical thing is that 40% of photosynthate that goes into root exudates plus the 30% the photosynthate that goes into roots. So the whole business of soils is down under in the soil, the carbon that plants are putting in the soil. So we need continual green cropping, pumping carbon into those soils. And we need the microbes that are converting that carbon into stable soil carbon to build the sponge, to build the soil structure, to build the in-soil reservoirs retain the water. We can, in your soils, yeah, put 15 tons of carbon per hectare per annum back into those soils through these agroecologies. So let's come back and sort of more or less detail how that could be done and then have the discussion how you would in a pilot demonstrate that to say, look, this is a way of accelerating the organic regeneration of those soils. And with that, their hydrology, and with that, their biofertility. But perhaps the next thing I want to mention in the context of COVID, the virus, is really perhaps the most important thing, because this virus is now global, and it's here to stay. And even if we get a vaccine, and that's not certain, we really have to now look at an issue of preventative health. How do we enhance the resilience of communities 
to these viral diseases. And of course, the critical thing about preventative health and resilience is actually our, the nutritional integrity in our food and its capacity to provide the nutrients, the biochemistry, the enzymes that are fundamental for our disease resistance. At the moment, basically, well, this is global, but basically there's 5 billion people on this planet that are effectively malnourished, either, you know, famine, obesity, or trace element, subclinical malnutrition. We don't get enough nutrients in the food because as uh, Rajiv said, the green revolution has given us cheap calories, but we've lost the whole nutritional integrity in our food. And we have to restore that. We can restore that, but only if we go back to these natural farming systems where we're basically taking up the nutrients as in nature through these microbial processes that are responsible for the fixation, solubilization, access, uptake, and cycling of nutrients rather than relying on fertilizer inputs. The other thing in the context of COVID beyond this nutritional integrity preventative health message is we've got to accept that the world has changed and we now need to, need to rebuild autonomy in regional food systems which means that we have to relocalize supply chains. We have to get our biofertilizers from recycling local materials. And it's an amazingly powerful opportunity because this is where the eco enterprises for the 21st century will be. Now, how do we actually build the inputs and the supply chains and the value capture strategies and again, as Raji was saying, this is where the youth can really get engaged. This is where the whole regional eco opportunities come. How do we relocalize? How do we re get autonomy in our food security? How do we get autonomy in our nutritional integrity? And we can do that through these natural farming systems. But now coming back to VJ, the only way we can do that is if we actually look at these strategies from the grassroots at a regional group level through the self-help groups that actually have been pioneered in India so wonderfully, where literally we have millions of people, farmers coming together as groups and then saying in their regions, what is it that we need to do to rebuild agriculture from that grassroots up? Of course, we're going to need politics and of course we need finance, but it's really empowering the farmers, the communities at that grassroots level to do this. And again, what Vijay's done in India is exceptional because it's the power of those self-help groups, largely run by women, that have actually turned this whole system around and they're going to be critical for the future. So look, uh, that's enough for me to say at the moment but we're very happy to come in and give you the technical substantiation, the details, the options, and then have that dialogue on all those different frontiers. So thank you very much. Thank you, Walter. And as usual, uh, you were brilliant. You brought out so many <laughs> insights. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Elian, what I will do now is respond to the various presentations that have come and already Ravi and Walter have uh, you know responded on many important issues uh, I'm trying to see what are the issues that are uh, left out and uh, so I will uh, respond on that uh, but first of all I must thank the colleagues of uh, from Rwanda uh, particularly Patrick he's been very open he he has mentioned the challenges of which agriculture in Rwanda faces, but he said he's open. He said, you come and convince me. And uh, thank you, Patrick, we will do that. And we also want to convince uh, the farmers. And as you, as Patrick mentioned, let the, the farmers decide. And I think Patrick doesn't have to look too far 
the various organizations in rwanda themselves are doing excellent work so i i i can see that there is very good localized interventions in rwanda many of them as they said are new but i was very excited very inspired listening to rosine sam and liberal uh, i think that is the so it's nothing new that we are going to bring to rwanda it is essentially how do you mimic nature what, what whether the only way to look at things is not whether it's from rwanda or india or australia nature's laws are same gravity is the same everywhere it doesn't differ between rwanda and australia so nature's laws and what is the most important thing for rwanda right now is the soil organic matter carbon instead of being in the soil is going into the air and because of which you are having the various uh, negative effects erosion etc so natural farming or whatever name you give as i mentioned on monday those principles and practices which retain carbon in the soil and also take carbon from the air and put it back into the soil so what are those principles and practices and today we saw from the presentation from uh, colleagues in rwanda that uh, conservation agriculture agroforestry is being done yes that is part of the solution what i would like to uh, suggest is can there be a more uh, integrated uh, package because there are certain things which are uh, missing in this but quite a lot of it is there so that's that's the hope you know it's nothing very totally radically new it's very well understood by uh, the various practitioners in rwanda and that's what makes me very optimistic about uh, the the offtake in uh, rwanda so we have one model in andhra pradesh called the five layer model so we have trees and crops trees fodder very well integrated and uh, farmers are taking it up because the trees are such that these are fruit trees these are uh, trees giving fodder these are trees which are giving shade of course they they are not just timber trees the trees giving nitrogen so you have trees of different heights so this five layer model will send details of that is enabling farmers on very small plots of land to get incomes every week and every month so the quality of income and the diversity of the nutrition has increased and at the same time given the diversity of crops on the ground the the root exudates the diversity of the soil microbes has increased and therefore we are putting more and more carbon from the air into the soil through this process so small patches of land this uh, modified agroforestry uh, which gives variety of products will be of great use and uh, uh, what i found which can be you know colleagues who are already on ground can integrate is our concept of 365 days green cover so you should have at all times 12 15 20 different crops in the ground being harvested at different times and and as i mentioned the other day 70% of that work is happening below the ground and the uh, the animals can happily graze on this so you don't have any shortage of fodder so there are this is this can be integrated into the conservation agriculture with cover crops but definitely uh, no to biocides no chemical fertilizers no pesticides no herbicides weedicides because this will kill the soil microbiota and covid has taught us that we are living in a microbial world let us face it and we have always been living in that so there's recognition has come how do we use that how do we how do we use principles of nature not go against nature the one thing which i found you know needs to be strengthened in the rwandan situation is the use of biological stimulants um i i did find a mention that you know we don't have enough cows how do we put in 10 to 15 tons per hectare 
So in our system of natural farming, you don't need 10 to 15 tons per hectare because even that will get oxidized. So what we have done, the smart thing that has done, been done in Andhra Pradesh is to convert them into biological stimulants. So we now require not more than one to one and a half tons per hectare over different seasons. So it's only 10% of what conventionally people were using as uh, you know farmyard manure. So I saw the population of cows in Rwanda. I think it's more than adequate to actually produce these uh, biostimulants. And let me also tell you the, the re one of the reasons that we are getting such great results in Andhra Pradesh and in India is the role of biostimulants. And it's an incredible, uh, you know, we still don't understand what they're doing. They're not producing nutrients. They are producing multiple things. And I know uh, Walter can actually keep us engaged for two hours only to explain to us what these uh, biostimulants are doing. And that is a very important thing, which I think colleagues in Rwanda are missing. So that is one I would suggest something which uh, need to be done. So I think uh, to conclude, as far as the knowledge package around uh, regenerative agriculture, natural farming is concerned, the three examples that were given, I'm very happy that they are on the same lines. But perhaps what they can get more is when we share our experiences on the PMDS, the 365 days green cover, the role of biostimulants, and the concept of this five-layer model. But I am very optimistic that given the, the enthusiasm with which the, the colleagues on ground spoke, uh, this should not be very difficult to take forward in Rwanda. Now, what are the challenges that I see? And the biggest challenge I see is uh, how do you scale it up? How do you take it to every farmer, every farm family, if, if we meet the challenges posed by Patrick? It should make money for the farmer, it should increase productivity, it should uh, increase crop diversity, health benefits, so we have multiple benefits, not just yield per acre. We look at various benefits and benefits to the ecosystem, benefits to health and overall productivity. Uh, if, if it is proven as a better option, uh, both for the farmers, for the government and for the consumers and for the environment, then how do you scale it up? So there I think the, the role of uh, women's collectives and farmers' organizations is extremely important. And that is something, uh, you know, I would like colleagues in Rwanda to look at. And then the extension system. And I'm very happy, you know, with the examples given by Rosine and Sam about uh, the champion farmers, getting uh, young uh, graduates to do this agriculture. Very inspired. I was very inspired by these examples. And so how do you grow the champions? How do you nurture champions uh, so that this can be scaled up? Uh, Rwanda, you know, perhaps has uh, 1 million farmers. So you, you need to perhaps uh, develop a youth, youth force of around 20,000 uh, youth who are ready to do this extension work uh, you know, of course, make incomes as farmers, but then take this knowledge to others. And uh, then the other thing which I really would like to emphasize is that we adopt a whole village approach. Go to a village, you work with all the farmers, farm workers, youth, elderly, with everyone. Don't leave out anybody. So it takes five to seven years. But if, uh, if you do that, then uh, I think we we have uh, this. So, yes, yeah, somebody asked what is the follow-up system in AP? Uh, the women self-help groups, they review their own work every 15 days. The champion farmer sits with them and discusses with them. And then every day there is a field visit by the champion farmer in the village itself, where again farmers learn uh, from each other. So we have a very, very intensive uh, follow-up system, very intensive hand-holding system. As I mentioned on the first day, this is knowledge-intensive agriculture. It is not something you just buy from the supermarket or buy from the middlemen or middlewomen. It's not that. It is knowledge-intensive. So we are 
increasing the bonding between the farmer and the land, between the farmer and the animals and the trees. So therefore, very intensive handholding system is required. And then after some time, the farmer exceeds everyone's expectations because they then proactively search for knowledge. So we have a very good uh, uh, system of uh, knowledge dissemination and handholding. And we also found that natural farming works very well in degraded soils, acidic soils, saline soils. We have all kinds of soils in Andhra Pradesh and uh, we find extremely good results in these because we are actually remedying the soils the way they should be. We are not adding, of course, there were some recommendations that we should put externally zinc in the soil, somewhere sulfur in the soil, lime in the soil, but cost of that is extremely high and also the sustainability of that is very poor. So when we have uh, low cost natural farming solutions, so I would uh, definitely recommend you to look at uh, regenerative agriculture, natural farming solutions for these uh, problems. Uh, pest management again through agronomical methods and uh, uh, botanical formulations were able to manage pests. And the water board presentation was perhaps the most revealing presentation. Uh, worldwide, 70% water is used for agriculture. I thought India was bad because we are using 84% water for agriculture. And now I find that Rwanda is using 90% water for agriculture. So therefore, natural farming will reduce the water requirement by at least 25%. There are farmers who tell me that now they require it only half half of what they were requiring during conventional agriculture, even by conservative estimates, we, we can uh, reduce water consumption by at least 25%. So that should be a great incentive and that should also be included as an evaluation parameter by uh, the RAB, by you know, the agriculture board, that whether this system of agriculture, is it saving on uh, water? And, and thanks to Walter, we have found the trick to harness water from the air. So we're not worried only about the groundwater, surface water, or rainwater. We found a, a, a very, I mean, I would say the most valuable uh, gold mine, and that is water in the air. So can we, through regenerative agriculture, through natural farming, you know, uh, work in harmony with nature and harness this resource? So then you, you won't uh, look at a, at, a, at this problem. And so uh, I, I think I'll conclude here. I'm, I, you know, there are, uh, I hope some of the concerns raised by colleagues in Rwanda have been answered, but I know it's a long haul. Uh, but what I would really request Elian is that uh, based on our two sessions, if, uh, you know, if you are colleagues in Rwanda are convinced that this is something that needs to be tested, tried. Obviously, we are not suggesting it should be done the whole scale, not at all. It has to be tested. There is a period of proof of concept. There's a period of uh, piloting, and then there's a period of scaling up. So we have to follow these processes. So if colleagues in Rwanda are convinced, then uh, we'll be happy to, to partner with uh, Rwanda and uh, look forward to uh, hearing from uh, colleagues from Rwanda. Uh, thank you. And I would like to thank all the panelists and uh, especially Ravi and Walter <clears throat> for their uh, insights. And, uh, but congratulations to all the colleagues in Rwanda for actually when I was listening to the presentations, I thought I was in Rwanda. So they, the, those photographs, the, the various interventions are, are extremely inspiring. So my best wishes to, to them. Thank you, Elliot. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vijay. This, this was really a very rich session. I, I would like to thank everybody who stayed on for this long. Um, this is really the beginning of a knowledge exchange. And so uh, 
Parmesh Shah from the World Bank, who was unable to join us today, has helped us uh, really create the space. And so I, I want to thank him, even though he's not here with us today. And the idea is really how do we initiate this dialogue so we can shift paradigms and get people to look at agriculture in a different way. And I loved what Vijay said in terms of this is about knowledge intensive agriculture. So how do we bring the best of regenerative agriculture, metrics and digitalization to increase food productivity, safer food, while also allowing biodiversity to come back. And their notion of perennial crops and the perennial cereals is a new notion that we need to look at as we also integrate agroforestry. So there's so much more we could be discussing. And what we hope is to, in the, in the fall in September, to continue these knowledge exchanges so that we can deepen our understanding of each other and understanding of ways we can build together to help achieve the SDGs. We have 10 years ahead of us. I really think that this India Rwanda knowledge exchange can be a really important driver in changing how we look at sustainable development and food security and biodiversity conservation in Africa. And so I just want to thank everybody for staying with us for this long. I, I particularly want to thank Ravi and Walter for, for really agreeing to be here today and listening in and helping uh, Vijay respond to uh, all the questions and all of the uh, important points that were brought in by the Rwandan experts. I thank all the speakers. I thank you, Juliet. I know we weren't able to bring you in. I'm glad on Monday you were able to give us some really strong remarks. We will definitely work to make sure that we are able to bring your presentation to everybody uh, later on. And so I, I think it's, it's important that we close because I, I'm thankful for everybody for staying for half an hour longer. And as I said, this is a discussion that we will continue for any of you who want to be involved in the long term, please reach out to me. As I said, this is only the beginning of this knowledge exchange. We want to continue this. We want to pilot this. We want to show the efficacy and we want the science to back this process that we're embarking on. And so this is really something that is a beginning of a journey together. And uh, thank you everybody for for helping us. Thank you, Swati, for in the background doing so much to bring people in. Uh, there are a lot of people working in the backgrounds that were very helpful today. And so I just want to thank everybody for your presence, for your time and your energy, and, and for the wonderful thing that things being done. And this is really important in terms of South-South cooperation. I think this is really taking leadership in terms of paradigm shift. And, and I'm just very thankful to everybody to have shown up today. So thank you. Thank you. And wishing you a great evening, a great afternoon, wherever you are. Rosine, I see you. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Really, thank you, everybody. I am so grateful for this opportunity today and uh, wishing you a blessed day. Stay safe. May you stay healthy as we navigate COVID and may we all work together for a next normal where conservation, biodiversity, food security, agroforestry work together for a better future for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elian. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, doctor. Bye-bye. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> but, uh, would you mind to send the presentation, please, Dr. Elian? Yes, yes, yes. All the presentations, we will. I will request them from all the speakers, and we will uh, make sure we can send them all. Thank okay, you, Mina. Thank you very much. Merci, okay. merci tout le monde. <laughs> chane, chane. Chane, chane. <laughs> 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 we'll connect. Yes. Thank you. Shall we close the call? Yes, yes, you can close the call. Shaman, can you close it?